to introducing uh, Reagan. And Reagan, feel free to uh, share your screen or, or do it in a moment. But uh, Reagan is going to be talking with us today about integrated analytics, a framework to scale your analytical operations. Um, Reagan uh, <laughs> has done a ton of stuff and it's really impressive. I don't know, it's, you have like all these different companies and things you've started, but uh, you're, you're a co-founder and principal, is it at Iconos Analytics, is that correct? Okay, great. Yep. Well, uh, also, if, if, you, if you haven't heard or come across over time, she's also the founder and CEO of Women in Analytics, which is a massive, it's grown into a conference, it's grown into this global community uh, where Reagan, I'm sure you can talk more about what it is exactly, but started as she was a student at Ohio State, hoping to find a community, more women in analytics, um, started a small conference, which has really grown into an, an amazing community. And I know COVID's been difficult for everyone, especially live events, but um, really it's been so cool to, to just follow along um, as I've gotten to know her over the past year or so, because uh, she's literally having people fly in from across the world to Columbus for her conference. And so that's just such a fantastic thing. Um, but our tech talks, what they really are is a monthly Ohio technology community meetup where we can share new ideas. Uh, people that attend can have the opportunity to network, learn, uh, see what's going on, and, and hopefully are introduced to something new. And before we begin, I do want to thank Ashland University. Uh, their world-class MBA program is the sponsor for this event. Um, and so if you have any questions or interest on perhaps getting an MBA, they've partnered with Ohio X where our members, their employees, et cetera, uh, can receive 10% student or 10% tuition discount. Um, so you can learn more on our website at ohiox.org, but really want to thank Ashland and their MBA program for the sponsorship of this. Um, but without further ado, Reagan, I'll turn it over to you and really looking forward to learning more about your work and the expertise you've built uh, with Women in Analytics and your consulting firm and all the different things you're involved with. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. And it was great to hear, um, hear everybody where they're from, what they do. Um, it, it is really nice to understand kind of the audience. Usually I'm talking in a web, uh, webinar form and I don't know who I'm talking to. Um, so this is really helpful and it's good to see faces too. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I've got probably around 20 minutes or so of content, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit longer, just depending on how um, how much I feel like, you know, <laughs> elaborating and talking, which is usually a lot. Um, so that estimate might be off, but um, I would love to like hear questions and, and talk about this topic as well. Uh, I know we have 45 minutes um, until the end of this thing. So um, I, I get most value when I'm kind of engaging about this topic. Um, so as you think of stuff, you know, let me know and, and we can talk about that. Um, so as Chris mentioned, uh, I am going to be talking about this concept of integrated analytics um, and basically what that means. So as he also mentioned, I started Iconos Analytics uh, earlier this year, actually, and um, my, my business partner, Ali, and I basically focus specifically on the kind of more... Um, like strategic level and technical level integration pieces of enabling analytics capabilities within an organization. So I'm gonna talk about that and I'm gonna throw a little kind of personal spin on it as well. Um, so just a little bit of background about myself, as I mentioned, um, co-founder of Iconos Analytics, uh, also founder and CEO of Women in Analytics. Um, we host usually an in-person conference every year in Columbus. Um, and this year we were anticipating around 1500 people. Uh, as Chris mentioned, we do have a global audience. So we have people fly in from all over the world every year for that conference. Um, we launched a digital online platform this year, which is really exciting. And so we're able to engage kind of virtually um, as well, almost as well as we could in person. Um, so we're really excited to have our next in-person conference. Um, hopefully early 2021 or mid 2021. Um, I'm also an instructor at Cognitier, which is a, um, an educational based startup company. And so I teach web development, uh, data science courses, SQL courses, Python courses. Um, in fact, I have a Python course at five o'clock today. So right when we get off. Um, and I'm also an advisory board at, uh, for Ohio X. Um, I sit on the board for the data science uh, summer camp for women that Ohio State puts on through their um, translational data and analytics um, organization or institute. Um, 
And then I'm also an advisory board member for Franklin University for their master's program in analytics, um, bringing some you know, industry expertise to, to their curriculum. Um, a couple of other things, I'm actually from Elyria, Ohio. So if any of you people in Cleveland know where that is um, and migrated down here to Columbus um, to go to Ohio State. Um, and just kind of a fun fact as well, I'm also a rescue diver, which will definitely play into some of the narrative of this uh, talk um, also. So um, a little bit about Iconos Analytics. So as I mentioned, we, we help organizations with the general architecture and framework to advance their analytical capabilities through aligned and incremental improvements towards this integrated system. Um, my specific background on this topic was essentially designing architectural um, views and systems for large banks in New York. And so I spent a number of years doing that, um, thinking about these kind of complexities of integrating environments, um, data warehouses or data storage, um, in addition to development environments for machine learning, these kind of dashboards and Power BI and, and business intelligence suites, um, and, and also connecting all of this to different business units. And so there's as you probably know, if you're in the space, there's a lot of complexities to that. Um, larger companies are trying to figure out how to integrate systems that they've had for a long time, migrate models off of mainframes written in C to the cloud written in Python. And, and there's, there's just a, an enormous amount of complexity that comes with um, enabling your company to, to build analytics that are super effective. Um, and typically what we see with organizations is that they're building these kind of proof of concepts and they're using those in a production like environment. So I'll talk about what that means a little bit more in depth, but I'm going to walk through this example of integrated analytics like I would from a scuba rescue perspective. Um, so you're going to learn a little bit about rescue diving um, in this talk too. So what can scuba rescue teach us about rescuing analytics? Um, typically, we, we often hear that a lot of organizations are investing enormous amount of money and resources into trying to you know, glean uh, insights out of their data. And so uh, I think we've hit this really interesting point within that maturity model where we've solved a lot of really complicated technical challenges uh, in that journey, but there's still kind of this disconnect of getting that ROI. Uh, so we've done a lot of the investment and we've not seen a ton of the return and a lot of companies are, are really struggling with that. Um, and, and I think it's still more or less kind of the wild west um, from that perspective. So I wanna talk about putting some general structure and a framework around that. Um, and again, we're going to be drawing a lot of parallels with rescue diving. Um, so on the left, you can see uh, when you start off with rescue diving, you're, you're really gathering as much information as you possibly can up front so you can understand what you're trying to look for or who you're trying to look for. Um, you're kind of assigning everyone a task, somebody to call uh, you know, an emergency line, somebody to give you information about the last time somebody was seen, what were they wearing, what were they doing, and uh, it's, it's really kind of no different than understanding the, the requirements and the general kind of critical components before you dive in to start building something like a machine learning model or, or a um, business intelligence dashboard. So the second piece is really locating that object or person using various search patterns. And again, there are a numerous techniques in order to build analytic solutions. Um, and again, there are lots of different ways that you can actually search for an individual or an object in murky water. And so these different kick patterns, different search patterns, you're kind of dividing and conquering and you're, and you're generally trying to do this as fast as possible. Um, and so that's kind of the process piece. It's like, okay, now we've decided what our strategy is, what our objective is. We need to generate some sort of process to get there and to accomplish that task. Um, and then the third and final piece is um, being enabled to do that. So from a rescue perspective, we're, we're talking about equipment. Um, you know, do you have your regulator enough air? Do you have a, a, a separate regulator if somebody needs air underwater? Do you have your dive knife? So there's all of these very specific things depending on the environment. Um, is it cold water? Is it, is it salt water, fresh water? Those all play into a huge aspect of what you need to prep yourself with before you enter into the water. The same thing is with technology. 
um, as we're seeing more and more diversity in these use cases of using analytics, we have this huge need of different um, aspects of technology. So it might be a, a lot of data that's required for training a model. And in that case, we're going to have different, different technical specs than if it's something um, a lot smaller. And so again, lots of investment and we're seeing um, not as great of a return on a lot of these in, um, initiatives for organizations. So I'm going to walk through what the integrated analytics framework is from those three um, talking points. So first and foremost, foremost, what is integrated analytics? Um, this is basically delivering value-driven, scalable, and streamlined analytics. So like I said, aligning teams to strategic initiatives, structuring and defining the collaboration points and handoff points, and making sure that there's the technical capabilities and architecture to automate and govern the whole uh, process. And again, these are very, very um, paralleled to rescue diving because you're trying to identify exactly what it is you're looking for, gather as much information as you can, do it as quickly as you can, and streamline the entire process, make sure that you have what you need to accomplish that. Um, so let's start with strategy. And I know this topic from a strategy perspective, obviously it's, it's generally ambiguous when you talk about strategy. And so I wanna try to, you know, make, I wanna try to pull out the details to make it a little bit more tangible. Um, and so, one exercise we often do is, you know, there's a there's a large question for organizations about what's most important. What should be what should we be working on? What questions should we be asking? How do we measure that? How do we know that there's an impact when we do something? And those types of questions are really critical to being able to align analytics organizations with, with what they should be working on first and what those requirements look like. And so when you start to think about aligning those teams to the strategic vision, there's this huge, huge, huge gap on, okay, we have this strategic plan, we have the strategic vision, and now it's time to actually build meaningful things to, to make that happen. Um, and so we can talk about what that vision looks like, what the levers are, what the metrics associated to that are, and what projects we can do or what initiatives we can do to enable that. And so one exercise that we typically go through at Iconos is this compass exercise. So we're usually working with um, you know, the C-suite or individuals who are basically crafting and defining what that vision looks like. And we're trying to drill down into very, very specific objectives, specific metrics and specific initiatives that we can make happen in order to enable that. And of course, data and analytics is a huge piece of this because it's just a tool for us to be able to accomplish something at the end of the day. So from a vision perspective, um, we want to really lay out what that means. So if you think about it from um, a particular industry, if I were to make this more tangible, maybe manufacturing is something that we look at. So uh, in manufacturing, safety is obviously a huge thing. So they want zero safety incidents. Um, they want to be able to produce their products on time. And so there's probably all of these kind of vision level um, statements that they have in place on what they want to accomplish. And then a layer deeper is really understanding those levers. So if we want zero um, you know, safety incidents in our manufacturing plant, what contributes to that? What are the levers that are gonna be able to make that happen? Um, and then one layer deeper is really this objective view. So what is the specific objective that will tie to that lever? Um, and so when we're talking about in more specifics, we're saying, okay, we want zero injuries on the line um, in this specific area. So we're kind of drilling one layer deeper and we've got a very, very specific objective um, that will move that lever that will accomplish that vision. And when you have a very specific objective, you can start to generate these metrics. And those metrics are how you actually define current state, define the state of the world. Um, and in order to move those metrics, we have to change something and we have to do something. And so the, those are these initiatives or projects that we work on. So when you think of indicators like um, KPIs, right? We have a couple of different kinds of indicators. We have these lagging indicators and we have um, leading indicators. And so an example of leading and lagging would be your lagging indicator would be your weight and a leading indicator would be your caloric intake. So it's something that is correlated. It's something that affects 
uh, a metric that you care about. And that way, you know, okay, if it's correlated and we know that that drives a change in that lagging indicator, we can do very specific projects to push that leading indicator um, in a certain direction. And so when you think about metrics and you think about organizational metrics, there are these kind of lower level metrics that teams that are practitioners or teams that are kind of implementing these projects look at where they're kind of measuring their own performance against those um, leading indicators. And then you have your, okay, how are we doing questions or metrics that you look at that kind of your leadership team is saying, what's the health? And so when we talk about analytics, we'll talk about it in terms of these metrics, these KPIs, but then also in terms of um, these different projects. So could we create a machine learning model that you know, moves something in a certain direction? And we can talk about data and analytics enabling all of those different layers, essentially. So this is one way that we can start to make things more tangible, make visions more tangible. And then once we get this, we can start to prioritize that. Because if you think about, or if you're familiar with a Pareto chart, right, you've got the 80-20 rule. And when you start to look at stuff like that, you start to understand what are the biggest, you know, um, key indicators for that. And we can focus all of our project efforts on that. Um, and, and this is just, again, a general way to stay organized and ensure that these analytics projects we're working on are aligned to a very specific objective that is a part of a broader vision for an organization. And this is arguably the hardest part. There's lots of technical complexities to, to all the fancy machine learning things that you can study, but I would argue this organizational alignment and understanding what's the intent um, behind these initiatives is, is one of the hardest parts. Um, so the second piece is process. So once we know what's prioritized, once we know uh, what we want to focus on or what we want to emphasize, um, then we need to, to lay out a process in order to make that happen. And there's a couple of different ways you can think about it. So if you're familiar with any of the software development um, methodologies or ideologies like agile or um, you know these different systems that are in place in order to gather requirements, build some software, test it, get it out there, get some feedback. Um, this is the type of process I'm talking about when I say process for analytics. So if you're building a dashboard, if you're building a machine learning model, there is a process that your organization likely goes through. Um, and typically what we try to do with that process is understand where it breaks down. And so um, the first thing we usually do is stabilize it, meaning we make it very consistent. So there's not a lot of um, variety in the process. It's, it's kind of standardized and there's consistency across it. That way we can identify bottlenecks or we can identify points of potential quality concerns. Um, the second thing we usually do is an optimization process. So once we understand where it breaks down, we know where we can start addressing that, improving those individual pieces of the process. And then the third and final one is to continuously monitor that, understand where it will, the next opportunity to improve it um, exists and do a continuous uh, improvement. And sometimes, obviously with large organizations, it gets really hard to stabilize. And so you will most likely have to go back through the stabilization process, which includes training and, and technical enablement to make things consistent. And so we really, really think about the process of building, deploying, managing, monitoring analytics in a very um, methodical sense. Um, and this, I'm just going to kind of clear this slide for you. So this is kind of our breakdown of an analytics lifecycle. This is an example of one. Um, typically, they're, they're rather customized uh, depending on the organization. Um, but this is an example one of the breakdown of ownership and the different uh, phases that an analytics um, project might go through. And so the first is obviously problem definition, understanding um, what the priorities are, and where the opportunities lie, what are those objectives, what are those metrics, um, what kind of change are we trying to drive, what kind of decisions are we trying to make. Um, and then the next one is really that business metric definition. Um, I would also place the risk and policy understanding in this um, early, early phase of project planning for analytics as well. Um, this is something that's typically overlooked, uh, where they don't understand what risk is associated with the type of project. 
the example I always give is a marketing uh, project versus something like a medical use case. So if we send out, you know, a if we're wrong and we're building machine learning model and we send out a mailer to somebody who doesn't want to buy our product, then we lose, you know, some sort of cost there, right? There's some sort of cost associated with that. But if we're in the medical industry and we're trying to detect or predict cancer, for example, um, you know, the risk of being wrong is much, much higher. And so if you're in the financial industry or if you're in pharma, you know, there's definitely policies and, and regulations that you have to adhere to. And knowing all of those things up front and understanding what's associated with this particular use case is extraordinarily important because it drives a lot of requirements downstream. Um, and again, metrics to measure something that we want to understand up front as well. Um, the basically like, how are we doing over time? The other thing I like to do is a very in-depth process understanding. Um, this is uh, typically overlooked as well. So if we're trying to change something specific, then we want to understand what it's mapped out to today. And not only that, but when we're looking at data and we're pulling data, we want to understand very specifically what the context of that data is. How is it captured? What systems um, have access to it? What kind of transformation or manipulation is done to the data? Why? What's the business logic behind that? What are the quality controls in place? And so if we can understand the process we're trying to change and the process that we're, we're using to capture and, and gain access to the data, um, and then we're in a way better position when we start doing exploratory data analysis and we know what we're trying to, to solve. Um, of course, there's user requirements, which I'll touch on later. And as you start going through a solution exploration, um, this is also very key. So this is a huge iterative process. Um, there's a feasibility uh, assessment and testing that, that you need to go through. Sometimes you just don't have the data you need to answer a question. And that is an, a potential outcome of, of a project. Um, sometimes the data you're looking at has significant data quality issues. And sometimes that is the outcome of the project. And so um, there's, there's definitely an explore, exploration, context gathering, um, baseline, uh, assessment and feasibility assessment um, that comes next. And then again, like I said, solution iteration. So if as we're going through different iterations of solutions, how do we measure performance? Um, what are the thresholds? And those are really defined by, again, the risk and policy in addition to the specific use case. Um, there might be a sense of model comparisons, which technique is yielding the better results uh, and model selection. And then finally, there's kind of this architectural view. So once we've decided, you know, this is the solution we're going with, there's an architectural understanding of what are the latency requirements? You know, what are we, what do we need from a technical perspective to enable that? And so uh, that's another piece that's typically overlooked. Uh, those people tend to not get pulled into the conversation early enough. These usually include conversations with data engineers, your infrastructure team, um, and you know, having those conversations up front will be very helpful when you start getting into the deployment process. And then obviously you have to deploy it, the SUM production system, which uh, I think there are a couple of stats out there saying that a lot of machine learning models um, typically take like six to eight months to get deployed into a production system and used. Um, this might be just for the larger enterprise and, and it's definitely being streamlined with some of the tech stacks like AWS and SageMaker where they have kind of a cohesive integrated system. Um, but for larger enterprise organizations that have kind of legacy systems or they have a variety of systems for a variety of reasons, um, this can be a really big technical challenge. Uh, and, and typically there's, there's not the right kind of layers of abstraction in place um, for organizations as they go through this process. And of course, we want to do cost estimates as well, um, because we want to understand how, uh, what the cost is of this product over time to run it, to be able to maintain it um, before we actually go live. And then the final part, which is promoting and integrating this into our business system. And so typically when we hear promotion, we think technical promotion, like I go into, you know, uh, my environment and I literally move it into a production system. Um, that is one piece of it. 
But the second piece is the business integration. So if I'm moving a Power BI dashboard or a Tableau dashboard into a prod system with prod data, um, the final piece there is somebody actually looking at it getting their insight from it and going and doing something. And if we don't think about that piece, the whole thing doesn't matter. Um, same thing with you know machine learning models. All right, it's great that it can predict something, but if you're not linking that into your system somewhere or it's not doing something specific, it doesn't trigger an action, then the whole thing doesn't matter. Um, and so that piece, that last piece of integrating that back into the system provides this kind of feedback loop and mechanism for us to continue iterating on its performance and understanding what kinds of improvements we can make to it moving forward. Um, so this is just, a, like I said, a very generic breakdown of what this looks like. It's drastically oversimplified as well, um, but just to give some baseline on what we mean from a process perspective. Um, and the other piece I talked about a little bit, which is requirements and design. Again, very much overlooked uh, typically. When I talk about requirements and design, I don't just mean like, what kind of decision are you trying to, to uh, make? Um, that's true, but there's other questions we have to ask as well. How often do you have to make them? Um, do you wanna actually go into a dashboard and filter stuff and look for stuff? Or do you just want an alert when it hits some sort of threshold? Um, those are the types of questions we have to ask upfront. Um, the second is around data, like what, you know, what are, what are my thresholds of accuracy? Uh, what are my thresholds of scope? Do I need seven years of data? Is it okay to have three years of data? And those are, again, the types of questions we need to ask. And they're driven by the usage and they're driven by the, that kind of risk profile. And then the last one's around environment. Again, from a latency perspective, um, do I expect an answer within five seconds, within a millisecond, um, that will drive tons of requirements around the technical stack and architecture that we use to support the solution. Um, and finally, the feedback and mechanism. Um, this question of how well is my model performing? You usually need an actual to be able to test against what you predicted uh, in order for you to understand its performance. And that's one kind of lens of performance, right? So are the systems set up to be able to capture that data, store that data, and be able to kind of compare it to how our model is performing and display that to the right person um, who's watching it operate in these systems over time? And usually, again, this is an afterthought, um, and, and it's typically done on an ad hoc basis or it's spot checked. Um, but I would argue for a lot of use cases, it needs to be continuously calculated. Um, and so when we're talking about requirements and design, obviously this is very iterative, but these are definitely some core components of, of information that we have to gather when we start working on analytics projects. And then finally, the technology, which is my favorite part. Um, so technical tooling and architecture. So we wanna make um, everything that we're doing from an analytics perspective scalable and modularized. We also want to um, insert automation and governance wherever we can in the process. And finally, like I said, we need to have a, a mechanism to be able to capture and understand that feedback from um, the project that we're working on. You know, back to the very big compass slide that I presented earlier, um, how well are we doing? Are we actually driving those metrics in the right direction? Is it actually making the impact we thought it would? Um, this sort of understanding of ROI for these models or for these analytics projects are, are really, really, really hard to nail down. Um, you know, if something shifts in a certain direction, how confident are we in saying that it was our model that did that? So that's something that, you know, we need to think about from a technical enablement perspective. And then kind of, a, again, very, very oversimplified um, architecture view of the tooling and considerations. There's the infrastructure and the environment that it's running in, maybe for a BI dashboard, it's, it's some cloud instance of Power BI, or if it's in AWS and you've got a model deployed in there, um, that's kind of your, your base layer of the environment in which it's running. It connects to some data, presumably. Um, there's, there's most likely some sort of data processing or feature engineering that's happening. Um, and then there's, again, this kind of layer of cataloging and understanding if we 
derived all this value from this data? Can it be reused somewhere else? How do we persist that metadata and make that usable for other people in our organization um, to be able to provide value for them too? And then on top of that are the, the analyses that we work on or the models that we build and the reporting and dashboarding where we can understand alerts where we should draw our attention to um, or potentially do some more exploration into data that we're that we're producing at that level. Um, you'll see on the side there's kind of all of these different systems where, where organizations get their data from. And so to touch on that just briefly, depending on different characteristics of data, uh, it may require different structures that the data is stored in, um, maybe because of a cost perspective or, or how quickly you can extract data from that system. Um, data is coming from all over the place. So you're generating it internally, but you're also getting it from vendors that you've purchased their software and you need to get data from them. Um, and this is usually a huge issue for a lot of organizations because they don't get the data in the format or the structure that they want or at the cadence that they want. Um, and so understanding what all of those different sources are, what they mean, how they're, how they're gathered and centralized, um, that's a huge aspect of being able to enable a lot of these analytics initiatives um, as well. This is just a, a sample architecture uh, design of a, a machine learning model where you've got your training data, you have your kind of dev environment or your infrastructure uh, set up you're training the model, it produces some sort of artifact, might be like statistical coefficients of that training model. And then the scoring model sitting in some sort of product infrastructure, you have live data coming in, let's say through a website or something, it feeds through that model, we get predictions, we get answers, and it gets um, implemented or, or integrated into an application or some sort of user looking at that. And from all of this entire kind of workflow or process, we're capturing metadata about the whole thing. So how long does it take to train the model? Um, did the model actually grab the right data? Did it run into any technical issues there? Did the data change based off of what we thought before? Um, and all of those individual pieces about this whole workflow really need to be captured and they need to be um, displayed and understood so we can continue improving and optimizing um, our technical stack for uh, our analytics as well. So this is just kind of a, a slide of like who cares um, because there's, as I mentioned, lots of different people who are engaged in this whole process. Uh, including the business stakeholders and users. So of course they want to get clarity and they want some actionable insights. They want to go do something. They want to go make a decision. We've got product and project managers that are really overseeing this um, and being able to really understand the types of requirements they need to be gathering and kind of being that liaison between the business and, and the more technical teams. Um, you have your data scientists and analysts uh, who, who are obviously working on kind of the analytical structure of the whole thing and designing the different techniques from that perspective. Um, your data engineers who are managing your pipelines and making sure that you have um, the right data flow and that that's optimized. And of, of course, the infrastructure engineers or architects who are making sure that that underlying uh, technical stack is all integrated together and working optimally. Um, so that's my last slide. I know I talked a lot and covered a lot of information. Um, if you are interested in, in more information, we have um, some resources on our website too at iconosanalytics.com. Um, and thank you for listening. I appreciate uh, your attention. And I have to unmute myself. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Reagan. That was, that was really awesome. And uh, uh, really appreciate you walking us through that. So happy to open it up to any questions or thoughts from, from others uh, that anyone may have for Reagan.